And then we lost another one. And then another one. And then we get into the fourth quarter, and there's only two of us. And, you know, it was just, it looked silly and funny for two players against five. Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today, since March Madness is about to tip off, I'm going to share a weird and wonderful basketball story. It happened more than 50 years ago in 1964 in my home state of Kansas. Now, Kansas is a big basketball state with some strong teams contending in the tournament this year. Back in 1964, Kansas State and Wichita State made it all the way to the Elite Eight, where K-State beat WSU to advance to the Final Four. But as successful as those Kansas teams were in the 1964 tournament, they weren't the most extraordinary basketball story to come out of the state that year. That particular honor went to this guy. Larry Breer. And I am just turned 70 years old. And I um, reside north of Kip, Kansas, or seven miles east of Salina on a farm. Larry is my neighbor. He keeps some of his farm equipment in my barn. And in the winter of 1964, when he was a 16-year-old high school junior, he played the starring role in what by some standards might be one of the most unusual basketball games ever contested, a game in which every single member of Larry's team fouled out of the game, leaving Larry to take on the five opposing players by himself. Now I'll let Larry tell the story in his own words. It starts in a tiny Kansas town called Kip, which had recently lost its post office due to shrinking population. It did have a grocery store, and uh, it did have a a working uh, uh, grain elevator uh, and a mill that uh, would make grain for you. Uh, It did have rail service going by it at one time, Um, and that was, uh, other than that, in the high school, that was about the extent of... uh, of the major stuff in Kip, very small town. Started out uh, in a uh, one uh, one through sixth grade um, school um, in Kip, and then moved across the street to a what I would call a junior high, seven through eight, uh, a one room deal in the Kip High School, and then. Uh, and then continued uh, my education there at KIPP uh, at the high school until uh, 1964, and that was the last year that school was open. There was uh, five boys, 12 girls. Just to be clear here, that's five boys in the whole school. Now, 15 years earlier in 1949, the KIPP Orioles had won the B-Class State Championship in basketball, But by 1964, school attendance had declined to the point where if Kip wanted to have a basketball team, every single boy in the school would have to play. We were not very good, not very good at all. The five boys in 64, uh, three of us were farmers or off of the farm and two of them were uh, just residents. The five of us were always starters and uh, we played we played until if someone fouled out then we had a problem everybody enjoyed it to the level that you know we're going to compete we're going to try to win a game and uh, but it seemed like we always come up on the short end Kip's basketball team didn't compete in a formal sports league, but they played games against other small schools in the area, schools like Asaria and Gypsum. And on the night of January 28, 1964, Kip was scheduled to play the Aurora Eagles, a team from another small farm town about 50 miles to the north. By that point in the season, the Kip Orioles had yet to win a game, but on this cold Tuesday night, it just so happened to be homecoming, and Kip's gym was decked in the school colors, blue and orange, and it felt like everyone in town was in attendance. It was a winter evening, but you know, there was no, uh, 
no uh, storm or any snowstorm or anything around because uh, that was our homecoming night. Uh, and we uh, we had a good crowd. It was uh, country people, country farmers, uh, and a few townspeople, and um, and parents, of course. And I would guess I would guess there was, uh, from what I can remember, maybe 300 people there. It was one of the one of the better nights uh, for attendance. Well, of course, it started out equal, five on five. It was it was a very close game the whole time. I think at halftime we were we were ahead, but in the second or in the third and fourth quarter, that's when things started to fall apart. We lost our first player to five fouls, and so we played four on five. And, and we were still matching them basket for basket. Well, we were just focused on the game and, and you know, if you, if you have only have four players, you, you make do with what you got. And then we lost another one. And then another one. And then we get into the fourth quarter and there's only two of us. Well, I, I think it, it got it got kind of funny because they would not pull a matching player off the court. I mean, they kept five out there all the time. And, you know, it was just, it looked silly and funny for two players against five. I, I don't remember the refs being that aggressive, but... Um, you know, or, or that tough on us. I mean, and and uh, you know, I think I think we had to drive, being that we was so close, and stayed so close to him, that uh, we were aggressive enough to 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 try to beat him with two on five. But the crowd, I remember the crowd uh, being quite loud. Uh, especially as it got down to three on five and then two on five. It was, uh, you know, it was, that was a good support for Gail and I. And uh, he and I played and, and still matched them bucket for bucket. And, uh, and then he finally fouled out. And so it was that Larry found himself playing against the other team by himself, one against five. The score was 49 to 49, a tie game, and there were three minutes left on the clock. Gail Martin, the last Kip player to foul out, was the star of the team. He'd scored 23 points that night. So by all accounts, winning the game should have been easy for the opposing Aurora team. But for whatever reason, as the seconds ticked off the clock, the Aurora players couldn't get the ball past Larry. It was loud. Uh, the, the players that had fouled out were on the bench, and, and they were supportive. I mean, it, it was something that they, that they had never seen before in the history of KIPP. Um, so, you know, it was to be expected. I mean, they just, they just had a, they were having a good time, and, and hope in some way that I could could win the game by myself, which at the line for points. Vincent Pollard. I was thinking to myself, how do I guard five guys? I remember Aurora setting up a perimeter, half perimeter, uh, you know five guys standing in a half circle and they threw the ball back and forth, you know, dump, dump. and I was in the middle trying to watch all five or watch where the ball went. And, uh, 
My only thought was if I could intercept a throw, a pass, then and hopefully get the other end, either get fouled or make a basket, well, we'd be tied again. And uh, I lunged for the ball, and uh, that allowed the guy to go in and make a layup. And that made it 51 to 49. By this time, Larry had held off the other team's players for 2 minutes and 45 seconds. 15 seconds were left on the clock, and technically an aggressive drive by Larry could tie the game, or with the three-point play by way of a foul, could win the game for Kip. But this is where things get weird, since nobody knew whether or not, by the rules of basketball, it was legal for Larry to throw the ball into himself when he didn't have any teammates on the court. The referees stopped the game and read and reread the rule book for, I, it felt to me like 15 minutes over at the scores table. And I basically stood at my position in the out of bounds area. And I remember the head referee come over after this 15 minutes of reading the rule book. And he said to me, and I don't remember whether he called me boy, son, or whatever, but he said, he took the ball from me, and he said, there is no way you can finish the game. He said, the only way that you can get the ball in is to bounce the ball off of the foot or the body of an opposing player, so it touches an opposing player, or they would come down and somebody would come down and catch it for me and then throw it to me to continue the 15 seconds. But of course, they went to the other end of the court when they heard that, and uh, I was left standing there with the ball, and then the referee took it from me and said, game's over. The only thing that I can think of later on in, in time was I could have rolled it, but they would have they would have met the ball probably at the same time I would have if I'd run and caught it up and caught up with it. So uh, uh, it ended the way it did, and uh, and that's the way I remember it. And that's I think that's that's the unique part. Very seldom do you have, or I don't know of any other time that they've called the game with still time on the clock. And that's as close, probably as close a game as we've ever, ever played and still lost. And so it ended, on the verge of a possible miracle with a note of anticlimax. Had this game been played in 2018, of course, the weird ending to this weird game would have immediately gone viral on the strength of 300 smartphone videos. But in 1964, there wasn't even a newspaper reporter at the game. Still, for some reason, and nobody is quite sure how or why, Larry's basketball feat went viral anyway. Somebody must have made a phone call because that night, the story of the Kip Kansas one-on-five basketball game made the TV news in Wichita, 75 miles away, and the following day, the newspaper in Salina, which is the closest city of size to Kip, compared Larry to General George Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. By the end of the week, stories about the game had appeared in places like the Kansas City Star, the Detroit Free Press, and the Dallas Morning News. Radio personality Paul Harvey did a bit on the game, and a Methodist minister named Judd Jones built a sermon around it, saying, quote, There are times when we are playing the game of life when it seems like we are playing against overwhelming odds. But, to quote Romans 5, 3 through 4, we must rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts. End quote. 
All of this attention notwithstanding, Kip never did win a game that year, and within a few months of the game, Kip High School had held its final class. I mean, with 17 kids, they closed it the next year. We consolidated. And I had a, I had a, a, a choice either to go to Asaria, where I could finish my high school, or I could go to Salina High. And so I, it was closer for me to go to Salina High. So I went from 17 kids to 1,700. And the reason being so many was because of the air base out there. That was the last year of the air base in 65. When we would change classes, there's two levels to Salina High, or was at the time. And whatever level you was on, and we would all change class at the same time, it was just like a herd of cattle. I mean, you couldn't hardly get get down the, the uh, hallway to get to your next classroom. As for the next chapter in Larry's sports career, well, there isn't one. He didn't go out for basketball at Salina High, and the story of his one against five basketball feat might have eventually been forgotten were it not for one famous fictional detective. Hi, my name is Leroy Brown, but you probably know me as Encyclopedia. All my friends call me E.B. That's what I like to go by. There are three things I really like doing. Rooting for the Chicago Cubs, playing my drums, and solving mysteries. That's right, Encyclopedia Brown, or more accurately, children's author Donald J. Sobel, who somehow had caught wind of Larry's story more than a decade after it happened. I uh, went, to the, uh, went, to the, went to get the mail one day, and here was a letter from Miami, Florida, from a Donald Sobel. And I said to myself, I don't know any Donald Sobel. Don't know anybody in Miami. And I opened it up, and it proceeded to tell me that he was a, a paperback or a, a writer. And uh, he, uh, he wanted to put a book together of sports oddities. And that's actually how the story found me. Encyclopedia Brown's second record book of weird and wonderful facts came out in 1981, and that's how I first read about the Kansas high school kid who took on an entire basketball team all by himself and almost came out triumphant. I guess it was just dumb chance that years later I would move back to Kansas after many years overseas, and that basketball player would be my neighbor. And while Larry is now in his 70s and he hasn't worn a basketball jersey in more than 50 years, his feat remains a persistent story, in part because mathematically it's impossible to play in a basketball game more lopsided than Larry did. Of course, if there's one person who's remained stoic and matter-of-fact through all of this, it's Larry Breer himself. And when a few years ago a representative from the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame approached Larry about making a display about his feat, the man was greeted with some decidedly disappointing news. He wanted to see if I could come up with my jersey and um, of course this book the Sobel book and uh, anything else that I could you know add to a add to a display and I tried to find my jersey and it was uh, I was told that when the school was sold that they cleaned all that out and took everything to the dump. This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. You're listening to the pep band from southeast of Saline School, where kids from Kip, Kansas, now compete alongside classmates from Gypsum and Asaria. More about everything that was just mentioned in this episode can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com deviate. Feel free to drop me a line at deviate at rolfpots.com. 
This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Intro music is by Cedar Van Tassel. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. <laughs>